Hello and uh, welcome to the European Report. Uh, here we are again in the heart of the European Union in the European Parliament. In today's programme we'll be discussing the hideous terrorist attacks that we've seen in Denmark and also the beheading of 21 Egyptian Christians in Libya and asking how should Europe deal with the threat posed by the Islamic State. And in today's programme, I'm joined by Thomas Sandel, who is the founder and director of the European Coalition for Israel, my partner in crime on this programme. So it's Thank great you. to have you back on the programme, Thomas. And uh, also Charlotte Gutman, um, who is the PR, who's a PR specialist, vice president of the sorry, Coordinated Committee of Jewish Organisations, and you're also the vice president of ORT. Uh, in Belgium and also joined by Alex Benjamin who is the director of a new organization here called the uh, European Israel uh, Public Affairs so welcome to the program. Uh, I'll kick off with uh, you Thomas, um, you weren't on the last program uh, and there is so much in world events that have occurred over the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. uh, can you share with some something to our viewers uh, some of the diplomatic and political initiatives that uh, the European Coalition for Israel has been involved in. Well, thank you, Simon. It's always good to be back and, and good to be among friends. Uh, I will mention two events uh, which have taken place, say, within the last one month. Obviously, and that's where I met with Charlotte last time, that was in Prague in the presidential castle where we were marking the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. As uh, ECI, we went back to, to Krakow on Tuesday in the evening and had a very memorable uh, concert of commemoration in the Temple Synagogue of Krakow uh, with uh, David Harris, the director of the American Jewish Committee, as one of the speakers, with uh, Tim Upal, uh, a new minister in the Canadian government, with the head of the Jewish community in, in Krakow, and um, a concert uh, with uh, a French ensemble, uh, uh, Color Bach, who, who played Klesmer and, and Bach in an in interesting uh, fusion. But uh, just imagine being in that place, what used to be a lively Jewish community, when at one point a third of the uh, population in Krakow were Jewish, being there uh, just one hour away from Auschwitz on the eve of the 70th anniversary of the liber liberation of Auschwitz. It was very, very special, very moving. Um, quickly after we went to the United States, back to the United Nations, uh, in, in preparation for an event which we will for the first time mark Pesach, the Passover, in the United Nations with, uh, with a luncheon event. And again, to bring back this uh, uh, message to the nations of the UN to say that, listen, uh, the Jewish people have contributed with so much to not only the creation of the UN, but uh, to mankind. And um, to, to sit down and uh, think about the message of, of Passover, freedom uh, from slavery. And this will be in particular working together with the African nations of, of the UN. So uh, maybe I, I could add as well that uh, I was in, uh, of all places in the world, I was in Colorado and Texas uh, to meet with uh, Christian leaders who are uh, realizing that this is the, a time to stand firm with our Jewish friends. And there was a new initiative which was launched in, in Colorado to reach out to the younger uh, generations among Christian leaders to really get the Israel message. So, so it's been a very active and hectic uh, four weeks. Excellent. It's good to, good to know your update, Thomas. Thank yeah. you. And um, Alex, it's great to have you back on the programme. I know that you're Thanks, on Simon. last December's programme and it almost seems like a, a different world, um, sadly, now compared to the last two months. But you're also involved in a new organisation. Can you tell us something about this new organisation involved in, which is the, um, the European Israel Public Affairs? Thank you uh, very much for having me, Simon. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, basically, what we do at uh, Europe Israel Public Affairs is obviously we deal with conflict issues. Uh, and the, uh, the relationship between uh, the European institutions and Israel, specifically on the, on the conflict. But more than that, we wanted to, to broaden our reach. Uh, sadly, in Europe, there's a perception of Israel, uh, particularly amongst the parliamentarians and the Commission, yeah. just seeing Israel through the prism of a conflict. And we want to show that Israel is about so much more than that. And how we do that is we talk about uh, high-tech, uh, uh, medicine, pharmacy, uh, all the many, many things which Israel is contributing to the world, 
uh, which most parliamentarians don't know about. So that's how we, we try and engage as a, a broad an audience as possible, dealing with issues which aren't conflict related. Of course we deal with the conflict issues, but in parallel to that, it's vital for us when we're talking about Israel to show parliamentarians and the Commission that uh, Israel is about so much more than just a conflict. Excellent. Well, also want to thank you so much for helping me put the programme together, helping get guests and, uh, and, and so really appreciate the excellent work that you're doing as well. And it's thank a you, pleasure to work with you, Alex, and your organisation. And special thanks to uh, Daphne as well. Uh, and um, really got to thank you, Charlotte, for being on the programme. You're always one of my favourite guests on the programme. You thank bring you. the programme alive. So can you uh, give us a bit of a update on, on some of the activities that you've been involved in here in Brussels because you're very connected with the Jewish community, the Israeli embassy and also the Christian community as well. So I want to say thank you for inviting me and I'm also pleased to be in your program and um, what am I involved with lately? Well uh, I didn't wait for the events that are currently taking place in the world to get closer to uh, the Christians for Israel. And uh, I'm part of a committee called the Alliance, and I'm working as a Jewish uh, uh, participant uh, representing ORT, which uh, is an um, NGO uh, specialized in education and uh, vocational training, and uh, especially uh, emphasizing uh, technologies and scientific issues uh, for uh, the secondary level in high school. It's a worldwide international uh, network of schools and uh, it's non-sectarian and I think that uh, this uh, organization has a role to play today uh, in a search for multicultural living together within uh, schools. And I consider um, in this group, we, we are, uh, for instance, what are we organizing? We're organizing in the Alliance twice a year a cultural uh, event called Peace uh, for uh, Israel, Festival of Peace for Israel. And uh, we do it once in Antwerp and once in Brussels, a few already a few years ago. And uh, we consider ECI, European Coalition for uh, Israel, as our umbrella association. Uh, we take them as an example and we want to improve our uh, activities on the political level. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. And um, in the first part of the program, we're discussing the hideous terrorist attack that we saw in uh, Denmark only a few weeks ago. Um, Thomas, I know that you were at the funeral of Dan mm. Uzan, who was the uh, Jewish security guard. He's also an economist, did it on a voluntary basis, but he actually prevented a, a massacre from taking place mm. while Bar Mitzvah was happening. Um, can you share... Um, the sense of occasion at mm. uh, the funeral uh, and, and really a sense of how the Jewish community mm. in Copenhagen and Denmark are feeling in the light of this uh, mm -hmm. terrorist attack. Well, let me say first with a little bit of humour that um, we were discussing with my wife where we would go on a short holiday with the family and my wife said, let's not go to Paris, let's not go to London, these are trouble spots. And of course she remember what happened in Paris, so she said, let's go to Copenhagen. Because, you know, for us, Copenhagen illustrates really a safe haven, you know, Nordic being away from all the conflicts in the world. And, of course, what happened was completely the opposite. You know, that's where, where we saw the next uh, terror attack. So, it, 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 again, it illustrates something that, you know, the terror is coming closer to home and there are no safe havens in the, in the world anymore. So the fact that I, I attended the funeral was something that happened by pure coincidence. I had not planned to, to be at the funeral, but it was a very moving, a very special moment, a, a privilege really to be there with the Jewish community, uh, you know, in order to get in. Of course, I, I don't think we've ever seen that type of security measures in Copenhagen. And... and um, because, you know, they didn't know what, what would be the reaction to even to the funeral. And, uh, you know, just to stand there, I didn't have to say anything. I didn't, you know, give any speeches, but just to stand in, in solidarity with the, the people who have suffered so much and, and to, to get their sense of question, you know, is there a future for us in, in Denmark after this? Can we feel safe and secure? Uh, that was, for me, very, very special. Mm. 
Uh, and, and Alex, I, I want to bring you on board on this one. I mean, it very much seems that the terror attack we saw in Copenhagen was very much of a copycat attack that we saw in Paris. Um, you know, how is, can you give us a little bit of an understanding how the Jewish community is feeling across Europe with these rise of terrorist attacks against the Jewish community uh, and also the rise of anti-Semitism that we're seeing in Europe today? It's a very worrying time, there's no doubt about it. Uh, I would uh, start by saying that even though it's a deeply worrying time, that the majority of people that I'm speaking to across Europe and, and in my local uh, uh, Jewish community here in Belgium, the call that, uh, that uh, Netanyahu and others have made that come back, to, come back to Israel, Europe is no longer a safe place for you, has been wholesalely rejected by a majority of, of uh, the Jewish community that I'm talking to. They say it's unacceptable, that they feel that we have as much right to be in Europe as anyone else. Having said that, there's no doubt about it, Simon, that we're scared that this is a community that feels that it's, that it's under siege. I mean, I can give you an example. Last, uh, last uh, Shabbat, I was at uh, synagogue, and uh, we ended up, instead of our usual security guard, which is sad that we even need a security guard in the first place, mm -hmm. we had a security guard plus two armed uh, um, police officers outside mm -hmm. and army at the top of the street. Yeah. Okay? So this is, this is, this is the, the situation that we're in. Um, and what really, really struck me is after I finished synagogue, I, I came home, and I was walking down with my wife towards, uh, towards a market, and I walked past the mosque. And I saw the mosque, and I saw kids running out of a mosque, happy, smiling, yeah. families talking out on the street. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, something is fundamentally wrong. Yeah. And to use a Hamlet analogy, yeah. so, there's something rotten in the state of Denmark. Uh -huh. uh, when we're in a situation mm -hmm. where Jews can't feel free to practice their religion or feel that we're, we're afraid to do so. And that's the situation that the majority feel at the moment. We're hoping that it's going to pass. We're hoping that this is just a blip. But at the same time, our history tells us hmm. that uh, things might get worse before they get better. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Charlotte, maybe you feel the same way. What's the sense of feeling here in Brussels with the uh, Jewish community? with the attack we saw in Paris and now the attack in Copenhagen. Uh, and thankfully there was a foiled attack in here in Brussels last month as well. Um, how is the Jewish community feeling in, in, in Brussels and in Belgium? Uh, and what is the future, do you think, of European Jewry? We are very concerned, to say the least. I think we are not only concerned, we are worried for the future. And uh, I can even add that many people are afraid. Mm. Afraid to even go to the synagogue on Shabbat. Mm. Afraid to participate in an activity in a community center. So we're afraid to go out and to mark our Jewish identity. So to tell the story of the Israeli journalist who walked around in Paris with the kippah. Mm. He was um, doing this experience mm. a few days ago. And he came up with uh, the conclusion that it's a dangerous thing to go around with a Jewish identification mm -hmm. in the streets of <coughs> Paris. He was insulted, he was spitted at, and so on. So we cannot show that we are Jewish anymore. Mm. You, you cannot, people have uh, taken away the signs, Magen David, mm. um, around the neck, and uh, signs are being avoided. Mm not to attract attention. Mm -hmm. So um, this is the, the situation today. Now, if you look at uh, the website antisemitism.be, which is a website that is following mm -hmm. the antisemitic acts and uh, the report on those, uh, there is a rise of antisemitic activities in words, in acts, mm -hmm. in aggressions, when very related to the political situation in the Middle East. So you really see it in the statistics, and when things are uh, getting worse in, uh, in Israel, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, then there was a rise of anti-Semitic aggressions in, in Belgium, and I think it's, it's also the case uh, on the European level. Yeah. Now, I would like to, to read the, the, 
the sentence that was given in the report by European Strategic Intelligence and Security Center, ESISC, that mm. you probably know. And uh, they're saying that Denmark, Copenhagen shootings prove efficiency of individual jihad. Propaganda campaigns launched by ICE, Islamic State, and Al Qaeda. Mm. Voilà. So, this is a reality, a political reality, the background, mm. and we know that anything can happen anywhere. Mm. We don't know when, we don't know how, we don't know where. Mm. But we are conscious mm. that the danger is there, there is a threat, obviously. Mm. Uh, and Thomas, ever since we, we launched this program, I think mm. back in May of uh, 2012, mm. we've constantly warned about the growing mm. danger of anti-Semitism. Yeah. And now, sadly, it looks like it, it, it's a reality. Um, and in light of this, uh, certainly as Alex mentioned, mm. that the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu mm. has uh, ruffled a few feathers in Holland, particularly with um, uh, the French President uh, Hollande in calling for the Jewish people of Europe to come home. Uh, do you agree with his comments? Well, again, I think it's, it's important to make a distinction. You know, I'm outside of that family. I'm, I'm a friend of the family, but I think these are internal issues. You, the Jewish community worldwide will, will, will you know, have to debate. Obviously, what I could say, I agree, you know, 100% with Alex, what you said, you know, Jews in Europe should never feel that they are not welcome and safe and secure in Europe. I think that should be crystal clear to anyone. What conclusions uh, a Jewish person would draw in, in, in Europe is, of course, always an individual choice. But, but I think we have to be very clear in this house uh, throughout Europe to say to our Jewish friends, you know, Europe would not be the same without you. And I think, uh, and, and this time we can commend our leaders uh, in the Commission who said it very clearly, Mogherini, uh, Franz Timmermans and others, to say that, you know, the day that Jews no longer feel safe and secure in Europe is a day when, you know, Europe has, uh, has lost some of its, its values and principles. Uh, what I would say, you mentioned, we always speak about the rise of anti-Semitism. I, I think, and I, I put this on Facebook today, having returned to, to Brussels after, you know, a few weeks, uh, actually one and a half month, uh, a way that for the first time, in the history of this parliament, you have armed military personnel outside the entrance of the European Parliament. For me, this is a marker. It's a marker of what Europe looks like post uh, Paris, post Copenhagen. And, and uh, we can have uh, our own <coughs> thoughts about if this is something which is just, which will pass. Uh, away and say next time I, I return it will be back to normal but I have a, a feeling that this might be the new reality of Europe that we have to cope with for some time to, to come sadly. Mm. Uh, and Alex in, in Britain the um, all party parliamentary group uh, published a uh, a very comprehensive report on, on anti-Semitism, looking at anti-Semitic incidences from, I think, July of 2014 to November in 2014, which showed a sharp rise of anti-Semitism in Britain and incidences. Also, the Community Service Trust produced their annual report as well, which said that, it, it, that in 2014 in Britain, we saw record levels of anti-Semitism. Um, how important is it, do you believe, that EU and European governments get to grips with uh, this new rise of anti-Semitism before it threatens all of our liberty, all of our freedom and all of our democracy here in Europe? It's vital. And uh, one of the things that I'm doing at the moment is I'm working with uh, one of the previous guests, actually, Arne Gerica, um, who is uh, working, working for us at the moment, um, doing a, uh, a parliamentary question along with a, a, a group that I'm working with in Israel. And one of the things that we want to see, uh, which is vitally important at the moment, is a European Commission or European Parliament envoy dealing specifically with the issue of anti-Semitism. <coughs> Mm -hmm. and going around Europe, finding out what the prevailing attitude is, and if needs be, calling a spade a spade and saying, here is the root, the <coughs> nucleus of a problem mm -hmm. when it comes to anti-Semitism. Yeah. Because I see anti-Semitism 
and uh, the rise of, uh, of uh, fundamental Islam and the changing demographics in Europe as an inextricably linked. Um, it's a bit, if I can use a rather crude analogy, it's a bit like having a hornet's nest at the end of your garden, okay? And in a sense, the, the, the troops outside the parliament are indicative of this. Mm. Um, there's, a, there's this fear of going down to the end of a garden and tackling what is there. Mm. And we, 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 we know what's there and it's, it's a scary thing. It's what threatens us. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, this, it's what's, uh, what's scaring a majority of people in, in Europe. So. Either we tackle it and we deal with it yeah. and we call it what it is or we're missing a trick. I think it's very, very important yeah. to actually spell out mm -hmm. what the real causes of anti-Semitism are in Europe. I don't believe as a sudden uh, rise that all of a sudden there's a peak, it's uh, like a pressure cooker that it suddenly mm -hmm. boiled mm -hmm. over. I believe that we're dealing with a situation of a changing demographic in Europe mm -hmm. and I think part of that change in demographic and part of a rise in, uh, in a sort of more radical Islam is feeding an anti-Semitic uh, anti narrative. Yeah. Uh, and Alex, if our European governments and certainly here the European Parliament and the European Commission don't get to grips with this, uh, what do you fear will happen to European society? Well, uh, what I fear most is if I don't get to grips with it, we're going to be dealing with a lot more, uh, to put it bluntly, we're going to be dealing with a lot more uh, uh, Jewish funerals. They have, to, they have to deal with this issue. They have to, they have to tackle it head on. Um, what they can do to deal with it is, is, is initiate a dialogue and start talking about what the issues are. And why all of a sudden, why, because of these attacks, why are we seeing a rise in anti-Semitism? It can't just be because of Israeli actions. It can't just be because it's a facile argument to say, oh, well, it's because of Operation Protective Edge, it's because of what Israel's doing. That there's something more fundamental behind it. <coughs> and, it's, and it's not a very pleasant uh, thing to do, but sometimes you need to lift up the carpet and, and look at the, the horrible things underneath yeah, it. I agree with you. And um, Charlotte, I mean, your expertise is in PR. Uh, media, how much do you blame the European media for <laughs> the rise of anti-Semitism and is there a knock-on effect from European media coverage of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to the escalation and rise of anti-Semitism and also the terrorism we're seeing against uh, Jewish and Israeli targets in Europe? Absolutely. It is uh, terribly linked. There is uh, no other explanation to what's going on today. And I think the program of the jihadists is very clear. They don't like Jews, they don't like Israel. Uh, Israelis are Jews, although 20% of the citizenship is, uh, mus are Muslims. But this is uh, forgotten in the public opinion worldwide, gen generally, because people don't know exactly what is Israel all about. And there are so many aspects and positive aspects that we need to promote and uh, still because there is a lot of ignorance about uh, Israel. Um, I believe that uh, the media have a lot of uh, responsibility, have a great responsibility. We are at the Belgian CRIF, CCOGB, mm. um, about to issue a report on this subject, on this matter. It's an analytic report that was uh, written by a professor in history uh, in the ULB, Univers Free University in Brussels, on behalf of the CCOGB, a request from us. It's analyzing only the Gaza war that happened last summer, 2014, the way a newspaper and the National Radio TV tackled the information about this war. It was a war. We cannot talk about the conflict. It was a war. And um, so this is going to be issued, and I think it's a great tool that we are going to use extensively. Mm. And I invite you to look into this report because it will be uh, mentioned on the website of ccogb.be very soon. And this will be a terrible and fantastic asset for us to explain to the media and to get to their consciousness of the responsibility they have in this conflict. And uh, 
you know, it's the way they present it for years. I mean, I'm fighting this information for 20 years now. For 20 years, they are showing the, the fighters in the Middle East like in a very Manichaean way. So you have the bad guys on one side and you have the good guys on the other side. Mm. It's not as simple as that. Of course. You cannot reduce it and summarize it like that. It's much more complicated and it's much, it has much more nuances, mm. which the media sometimes forget. Mm. And uh, so we are in a very, very uh, dramatic situation today because we let it go. We let it go for 20 years and as um, uh, you mentioned um, the reasons of anti-Semitism. Uh, yesterday evening, I don't know if you are aware of, but yesterday evening there was a big scandal in Paris. It was the yearly dinner by the Quiz. Yeah, yeah. And the Muslim Association boycotted the dinner. Mm -hmm. They didn't attend. Why? Yeah. Because the president yeah. of the CRIF mm -hmm. simply said, so can you the, explain the, who CRIF are to our viewers? CRIF is the uh, community, the Jewish community of France. Excellent. Uh, the association representing yeah. the Jewish community yeah. in France. And they have a yearly event that is attended by 1,500 VIPs, all the political... Uh, Sarkozy was there. The yes, year. all yeah, the yeah. politicians are yeah. there. It's a very have-to-be place for the mm. people who are uh, opinion leaders in France. And uh, so why did the Muslim Association boycott the, this dinner yesterday evening and they attended this dinner for years mm -hmm. simply because Mr. Kuckerman said most, um, he said, the, the um, terrorist attacks are made by young Muslims and they were offended mm -hmm. although it's a fact mm -hmm. in the statistics maybe not all the Muslims are involved and obviously this was not meant by the Mr. Kuckerman, but they took it as an excuse to react. Mm. And I find it strange. I find it very strange. And I want to mention a um, sentence by Professor uh, Alan Dershowitz, who was in Prague mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in one of the panels. Yeah. And he said, this is the sentence that I remember from this whole forum mm. organized by the Jewish uh, European Congress. Mm. Um, what is the limit of intolerance? Should or rather, what is the limit of tolerance? Should tolerance accept intolerance? And this is the question I think that we have to debate. Mm. Absolutely, it's a very good quote. Um, okay. Thomas. Uh, yeah, I, I'd like to, to come in. I mean, the, the two issues which are very, very uh, interesting, of course, as both of you have mentioned, can we call a spade a spade? And we know this was very difficult in the White House. You know, everyone are looking around to see what is happening on the streets of, um, of Paris, of Copenhagen, of Brussels. They see what is happening in the Middle East. This is not football hooliganism. This is not extremism. It's something very specific. And I think we can never win this battle uh, for the minds of the people unless we, we call it for, for what it is. But let me also get back to, to media because um, just a few days ago there was a uh, upheaval in Sweden. Uh, you know, the, the Israeli ambassador to Stockholm, whom I know, was interviewed about the situation in, in Copenhagen. And the question that he was asked was this. Um, it was an insinuation saying, well, isn't it so, after all, that Israel and the Jewish people can be blamed for what is happening? And, and um, it, it, again, it illustrates the point where media is not explaining the situation, media is not clarifying, media is not a voice of moderation. Media, to a large extent, is enabling what is happening on the streets of, of Europe. And um, the good, uh, you know, conclusion of, of this incident, of course, was that people reacted. They started calling and said, well, did we really hear this question correctly? How can you even imply that the Jewish people would be somehow responsible for someone killing a, a Jewish guard in Copenhagen? It's, it's outrageous. But it was said by a very seasoned journalist. 
it only proves the point that I always try to make on this program is to say that we can make a difference. You know, whoever you are watching this program, you can pick up your phone, call your, your radio and say, well, listen, this is what I heard. I think it's unacceptable and, and I won't tolerate it because they had to come out and apologize. Uh, the head of Swedish radio would have to make a, a public uh, apology and the journalist came out and said, you know, I'm very sorry, I realize only now that this was, you know, a very, you know, stupid question. But the point still is that she didn't say it spontaneously. This, of course, had been screened by her colleagues, by her, by her bosses at the Swedish radio. And, but it's up to us to react because we, we will decide where do you put the, the, the bar. What can we accept? What can we not accept? And unless we will speak up, the bar will be lower and lower and lower when it comes to anti-Semitic slur in, in public media. So, Simon, may I may Sure, I of course, can. absolutely. Sure, uh, just uh, we had an example in the UK as well. Uh, it wasn't just uh, obviously in Sweden, with Tim Wilcox, uh, immediately uh, the BBC presenter, um, immediately after the, uh, the aftermath of Charlie Hebdo and, and uh, Hyper Caché. Yeah. Yeah, he came out, he did this interview, I'm sure most of your viewers are aware of it, where he said, um, uh, he's, he was interviewing uh, uh, a, a Jewish couple and uh, talking about how they, uh, what their experience was, how they felt threatened and everything. And he said, yeah, well, obviously, uh, you know, it's not just you. Uh, Palestinians feel threatened as well. So drawing this kind yeah. of sort of moral equivalence, what is worrying, it's all about the language and it's about the narrative. Yeah. And I can think of a BBC as well. When uh, just um, uh, last year, you may remember uh, the, the tragic case of the three Jewish teenagers that were taken off and, 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 and killed. Yeah. Um, murdered is what most people would say. Uh, they uh, were murdered. Uh. The BBC reported that they were killed, not by terrorists, but by militants. This yeah. is the kind of language that we're dealing with. That's quite strong for the BBC. It's usually gunmen. <laughs> but this is the kind of language yeah. that we're dealing with. Yeah. This, this, to, to, just to reinforce my point, and, yeah. and I think uh, yeah. uh, Thomas is with me on this, the idea of calling a spade yeah. a spade. Yeah. Either we call it what it is, yeah. or we just roll over and, uh, and, 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 yeah. and take it. Yeah. I think this is very, very important yeah. to, draw, to draw a line under the narrative and say, hold on, it's no longer to call terrorism militants. Yeah. It's no longer acceptable to call murders, uh, killings or, or, or deaths. We have to yeah. call it and yeah. say it how it is. Absolutely. Yeah. And may maybe the, the best way we can describe this <coughs> uh, of what you said there, Alex, is really to say that the Jews were responsible for the rise of Nazism across Europe. Uh, and we've got to look at the ideology and say, no, the Jews are the victims of this. Mm. They're not the cause of this. And, and, and one thing that's not being really tackled or dealt with is the threat that if we don't tackle anti-Semitism and we don't tackle it head on like you suggested earlier, then what this is going to cause is that this is a threat to the whole of European society. We, we see now that uh, Belgian paratroopers are outside Jewish synagogues in Belgium and community centres. They are uh, armed guards outside this parliament now. Commission, uh, where's wherever. It, where's yeah. it going to stop? because it's the same disease. These same people that are, are peddling this evil ideology have one goal and one goal only, and that's to create an Islamic caliphate, an yeah. Islamic world government under their control. They will not tolerate anyone else. But and we've I... seen that with ISIS, for example, that they won't tolerate any other Muslim who holds a, don't mm -hmm. hold the same ideology as them. Absolutely. So really, Europe again yeah. is in the threshold of yeah. facing an ideology like Nazism uh, that's spreading right across Europe and there's this indifference and apathy to confront it. Again, if I can just draw the analogy, and, 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 and I'll be very short. I, I use the analogy deliberately about the hornet's nest at the end of the garden. And I would say that either you protect your house and you stop the, the hornets from flying in, mm -hmm. like we have outside the commission, like we have outside the parliament, or whatever. That is a short-term solution. The hornets are still going to be yeah. there. Yeah. So do you go down to the end of the garden and you try and deal with a nest? Or do you yeah. just try and protect yourself in the house and say, well, listen, I'm too scared to go down there. I might get stung. I don't know what's going to happen. But all I can do is stop them from getting in the house. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's a very simplistic analysis, but I believe this is the fundamental problem, is that we're in a defensive mode and we're not willing or there's a fear at European level um, to actually yeah. admit or yeah. tackle 
that what we are actually dealing with, and that's the scariest part of it all, mm. that, that, that there's a fundamental fear or a recalcitrance to actually deal with what we're talking about. Yeah. No, I agree. And, um, <coughs> and uh, I just want to bring you on this one, on, on Charlotte. Yeah. Now, you, you're a daughter of a Holocaust survivor. Your father was a Holocaust survivor. Does the times in which we're living now feel something like the stories that your father told of what happened in Germany in the 1930s and 40s? I can only tell you that when the Second Intifada started and there was a dramatic anti-Israeli atmosphere around the world that mm. started like yeah. nothing yeah. after uh, the Mohammed al dura story, which became the symbol, who became the symbol yeah. of the Second Intifada, he told me the atmosphere is the same like in Berlin in the 30s. And he came up with his feelings. Uh -huh. He was living in Berlin mm. since he was born. Mm. And the, the family had been in Berlin, uh, fought in the First World War uh, mm. in the German uh, army and so on. So mm. there were Germans before being Jewish. There were Jews, German Jews, yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. And uh, so it was uh, very uh, impressive to hear it from him but I could not contradict him because these were his feelings. That's how he felt it. He went through it in Berlin and he, he felt it when he was here living in Belgium and very close to Israel also. So, uh, yes, it, was, uh, it is an issue, but what I believe strongly, being, a, as you said, a PR person and uh, with a journalistic background, I have analyzed the ethics of uh, the press and the journalism on this particular region in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can come up with a summarized sentence, not to make it too long. Uh, there are two um, communication tools that are dramatically used by the anti-Israeli propaganda since uh, about more 40 years, a bit yeah. more than 40 years, mm. that are the same tools that were used by the Nazis mm -hmm. in their anti-Semitic mm -hmm. propaganda campaign. First, the lies, yeah. and Goebbels said, uh, the bigger the lie, the better it will be uh, accepted, mm -hmm. and the more you repeat a lie, yeah. in the end people will start yeah. to will believe in it. Yeah. And the second is the turn speech. What is the turn speech? is you are going, and it's you, when you hear the politicians, the enemies of Israel speaking, mm -hmm. you can identify a turn speech. They are going to blame Israel mm -hmm. for whatever they are doing in fact. Mm -hmm. And this is a tricky, vicious way mm -hmm. of communicating. Yeah. But that's it. To summarize it, we are in a situation, in a messy situation, just because of the lies on Israel, mm -hmm. on Israelis, on Jews, mm -hmm. and the turn speech. Mm -hmm. And we are not responsible for the problems in the world. Mm. Who are we? We are almost nobody. Mm. We are almost non-existent. Mm. And a professor in the Ben-Gurion University made a research mm. a few years ago. How many would we be Jewish people mm. if there wouldn't have been all this genocide in our history? Yeah. Well, we would have been today around 250 million people. Mm. And we are not even 10% yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and um, yeah, I want to bring you on board on uh, Thomas. How much of the trouble that we're seeing in the Middle East, particularly the incitement to hatred we're mm -hmm. seeing, uh, not only in Palestinian media and education, but right across the Arab world, is being exported to Europe that is radicalizing these young, impressionable European Muslims to go and join a, a hideous terrorist organization like ISIS, the Islamic State, and, and carry out some of the most um, horrendous atrocities, the likes we haven't really seen since, since the Nazis, and now they're coming back to Europe and posing a direct threat. I mean, I can give you a recent report that I read uh, last month that stated that in Belgium alone, it takes 25 <laughs> police officers yeah. to monitor one mm. terror suspect who's come back from being part of ISIS in Iraq and Syria. So surely the, our security forces need to do more, but also isn't there a need to wake uh, European, the European public up mm -hmm. uh, regarding its apathy and complacency regarding the true nature of the threat that we face from the Islamic State here in Europe? Yeah. Of course, we have to differentiate the European 
Union is not financing the Islamic State, but they are financing something else. They're financing the Palestinian Authority. And, and what we know, and we've discussed it many times on this program, there have been conferences in this parliament about what is happening in, in uh, that community. And that's where the incitement is very strong. That's when the incitement is incorporated in the charter, not only of Hamas, but also of, of Fatah. And, and obviously, if there's anything we can do, because we can't do everything, we can't stamp out hatred everywhere in the world. But what we can do and what we have a responsibility to do is to make sure that we are not funding hatred. And I think, again, Alex, you have done a, a great job in, in raising awareness in the parliament about this issue. We did it a number of, of years ago, but still it hasn't stopped. And it brings me back to another question. It's, it's um, a discussion I had in Prague on this very special event. And I'm not going to name any names, but this was a prominent uh, EU leader. We met up, we had a, we had a meeting, and uh, so I presented myself. And, and he said, and, and what has Israel to, to do with any of this? Meaning what happened 70 years ago in, in, in Europe. And, and I think it illustrates a little bit of the problem in, in Europe today. Uh, when it comes to anti-Semitism within Europe, yes, I believe we have the establishment with us. You know, they would stand up any day and say, you know, they, the Jews are no longer safe in Europe, this is no longer Europe. But what they are not willing to, to make the link is to what is happening in, in Israel, in the Middle East. So on the one hand, they're clear on, on the situation on the ground in Europe, but at the same time, they are feeding, uh, maybe subconsciously, uh, um, suspicious hatred, incitement towards Israel. And, and I think if, if there's anything that the European Union should do at this time is to strengthen Israel. The only thing which makes sense in the Middle East today is Israel. It's the only democratic state, and what the EU should do is to strengthen, to support, to back this state, and not to try to weaken it, trying to jeopardize it, and, and trying, you know, this nonsense again to say, you know, there should be a Palestinian state next month. In, in. It's, it's not going to work. It's just going to be like Libya. Just, you know, look out yeah. and see what is happening. Absolutely. Uh, and Alex, uh, the final question on, on this issue uh, we'd be covering. Um, yesterday, the Daily Telegraph reported that the Somali-based terrorist organization al Shabaab was responsible for the West Keys terrorist attack in the mall in um, in, in in Kenya um, has issued a, a chilling video message uh, in which they called for terror attacks on London's Oxford Street, the Westfield Shopping Centre, um, and also they said that they have called on their followers to hasten to heaven by attacking some of the busiest shopping areas in the UK, also with um, shopping venues in America and Canada, and also Jewish-owned centres. What is it going to take for Europeans, I mean European population as large, to, to wake up to this threat? Uh, it's a very, very good question. Uh, I, don't know if it, I don't know if they're asleep as opposed to rather not wanting to actually deal with it. It's like the elephant in the room. That's the issue, is that uh, it's not that they, they, they haven't woken up. They know exactly what the threat is, but no. they just don't know how to deal with it. Because at the end of the day, the fundamental European values of uh, liberalism, of tolerance and everything are completely incompatible with the threat that they're dealing with. Mm. So how do you deal with an existential threat when you don't even know that where, where the tools that you're trying to deal with that threat, or dialogue, peaceful negotiation, whatever, these, you know, these, are, this is, these are groups which have no interest in that. They have no interest in, in, in us sitting down and having a dialogue. As far as they're concerned, the easy solution is to drag you kicking and screaming uh, behind this set and, and shoot you in the head or, 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 or worse. So how do, you, how do you deal with that? And I think this is the fundamental problem that Europe finds itself in at the moment. They just physically mm. do not know, physically, mentally, uh, politically, how to deal with this, how to deal with this threat. Yeah. Uh, and the final issue of today's programme, we'll be discussing the brutal and horrific murder and beheadings of 21 Egyptian 
Christians at the hands of Islamic forces associated with the Islamic State in Libya. Uh, and, and really, I just want to ask, Charlotte, what is your response to those images that we saw on our TV screens last week of 21 Egyptian Coptics standing in, uh, wearing those orange jumpsuits and being beheaded by Islamic forces uh, associated with the Islamic State Sorry, in Libya? I cannot look at these images. I switch off because uh, it's so barbarian, it is so unacceptable mm -hmm. that I cannot watch it like, what is this period? Where are we living in today? I mean, we are uh, in a so-called civilized world. So this goes, takes us back to the Middle Ages and even worse. I, I don't see how we can deal with it today. And I, I, I think that the governments are aware mm -hmm. that they have to uh, kill to the last jihadists in this world, to the last IS and so on. I mean, it was clearly said in the forum in Prague uh, that uh, the only way to eradicate the terrorism is to eradicate the Islamic State. I mean, I didn't say it. It's, yeah. These were the leaders, political leaders of Europe who, mm -hmm. who claimed it. Yeah. So they are doing it. They are busy with this uh, strategy. And I hope it will uh, be successful somehow, because you cannot live being afraid all the time. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, and Thomas, um, sadly, the, uh, Europe has largely ignored the plight of the suffering and persecuted church in, in the Middle East today, uh, and particularly in light of these horrific beheadings that we saw mm -hmm. last mm -hmm. week at the hands of Islamic forces associated with Islamic State mm -hmm. in, in Libya. Is now not the time for also for Christians to wake up and wake up out of their apathy and realize that the Christian community is under serious threat in the Middle East? And what policies can Europe do in order to protect these ancient Christian communities that predate Islam? It's, it's interesting again that we, you know, the first part of the program we were speaking about um, persecution of, of Jewish people. You know, the second part is persecution, what is happening of Christians in the Middle East. What I would like to say is that, and I may have said this before on the program, the only public voice for Christians in the Middle East, the only person who spoke up at the United Nations was a Jew. It was, and I'm proud to call him my friend, Ambassador Ron Proso, Ambassador of Israel, the only person to stand up in the Security Council and address this issue. Look what is happening in the Middle East. We cannot tolerate this. Christians are being slaughtered. And, and um, I think it symbolizes something. You know, it symbolizes that we, we belong together. It's, it's not by chance, by accident, that we are here as Christians and Jews, that we uh, share this uh, culture of dialogue, of respect, uh, of appreciation. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of my Jewish friends that they were the ones to raise this. If I go even further back, and Charlotte may, may remember this, uh, I think the first serious journalist to raise this issue uh, globally was A.M. Rosenthal, the uh, long-standing columnist of New York Times, who already some 20 years ago, he started to speak about the plight, uh, write about the plight of Christians in the world. And, and again, what a wonderful tradition that the Jewish people would be the ones to raise. I mean, you have enough on your plate, let's put it this way, but still to, to have the energy to, to engage yourself in the plight of Christians. Not only that, I, um, and I can't mention the, the, the details, but I know of um, initiatives to actually bring out the Christians from the region into Europe. Um, and, and so these are Christians, but the ones who are willing to finance it are from the Jewish community. That's incredible, isn't it? I uh, want to, if I may, want to add a demonstration quick, okay. we organized quick, here in front of the European Parliament, yeah. bring back our boys and girls. Um, yeah. This was also a common uh, uh, yes. work that yes. we did yeah. between Jewish and yes. Christians. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Uh, uh, and Alex, um, sadly we've seen the ethnic cleansing of the Jews from the Arab world and from the Middle East back in the 1950s uh, with the establishment of the State of Israel. And now we're seeing the ethnic cleansing of the uh, Christians. Uh, and the only safe place for Christianity and other religious minorities in the Middle East is Israel. Can you tell us why? Pluralism. <laughs> Very simple answer is that uh, Israel is a pluralist society. 
that we're not dogmatic, that, uh, that as Jews we value diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, there's the old uh, joke about, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the Jew that's stuck on a, on a desert island and they, they rescue him and he's got, uh, they, they find he's built two synagogues. And, uh, they say to, and they say to him, why, uh, why have you built two synagogues? He said, well, one's, one's the one I go to and the other one I would never step into, <laughs> okay? It's in our nature, it's in our nature to, to, to have a, a diversity of opinion, to argue with each yeah, other, yeah. To, to dialogue, to mm. talk, to, mm. to discuss, and we respect that. And one of, the, one of the most beautiful things about Israeli society and, and the state of Israel is, okay, it might be a Jewish state, but we have Israeli Arabs, mm -hmm. we have Christians, mm -hmm. we have Armenians, we have Orthodox, we have all kinds of people yeah. living in Israel. And it's this pluralism, it's this, it's this, it's this need uh -huh. to be around different views, yeah. Yeah. even if it's to, just to reinforce our own opinions, to say, yeah. listen, yeah. we respect your views, yeah. but that makes us even more uh, sure of our own, mm -hmm. that's fine. But when we're dealing with outside of Israel, there isn't this tolerance, there isn't this pluralism. Mm -hmm. it's, a dogma, it's a dogmatism. It's, uh, in fact, I, 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 we were talking about the Second World War. It's, it's fascism, it's my way, mm -hmm. or if you don't agree with my way, mm -hmm. then you're put to the sword. Yeah. And it's, it really is that simple. Yeah. Uh, we're down to the last uh, four minutes of the programme, so I think we, we, we have to sum up, really. And I'll, I'll start off with you, um, uh, Charlotte. <coughs> How can the Christian community respond and stand with the Jewish community? Uh, what we've really discussed as a very dangerous and critical time in European history right now. I think that uh, in a way I, I covered it uh, while talking about the alliance, which is this committee, Jewish Christian committee, uh, I'm very happy to be part of. And uh, we are trying uh, more and more, you know, to be active on the political level uh, because uh, we were a bit shy. Uh, we'll, um, ECI is more uh, uh, present and more active mm -hmm. and uh, we would like to uh, adapt our activities to your speed and dynamism. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> uh, and, and I just want to say this personally to both you Alex and um, also to you Charlotte that uh, you know times are getting tough. We, we see that the Jewish community is under siege. You know this is time that we uh, and I'm also sure that Thomas would conclude as well mm. that, you know, we're standing with you. You're not alone. This is why we do this program, mm. to give Israel and the Jewish people a voice, to explain the issues that the rest of the mainstream media are failing to tackle because they don't want to tackle it. So we want to tackle this head on um, so that the world can say that they weren't ignorant. They were ignorant in the 1930s, but we can't say that today. Well, Absolutely. Thank, thank you very much. It's, it's much appreciated. Yes, and I must say, in every single meeting we have with the Christians, with the Alliance Committee, mm. I'm so moved by the kindness of people, by the openness of the people, by the will to cooperate, to do something. It's, for me, very, very moving. Absolutely. That's a pleasure. An agreement. Uh, and Thomas, do you want to add something to this? Well, la last point, as, as you said, uh, I think this is very important that we actually can make a difference. We should never lose sight of, of this simple fact. This is what brings me to the office for the last 12 years. I would not continue to do the work that I'm doing if I didn't have a sense that I can make a difference, you know, you can make a difference. Today, together we, we can actually achieve something. And, and maybe even last point, it was so moving in the synagogue in Krakow when David Harris spoke and he said, you know, I, I hate this word tolerance you know I, of course I, I just don't want to be tolerated as a Jew you know I one one day I want to be accepted but perhaps even better than that I want to be loved and and I, afterwards I, I, I thought why didn't I say in the synagogue you know David listen I love your brother so I can say it here now Alex and and you know um, Charlotte you know we love you as as, as brothers and as uh, as Christians so uh, now it's said, on the record. Toda thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. I uh, just want to thank you so much for joining us on, on this Middle East report. And uh, hopefully we'll produce a program one day that 
<coughs> that's actually positive and upbeat. But at the moment, I think this programme sends out a warning and a wake-up call, uh, particularly to our viewers and others watching of the critical situation uh, that we're facing here today in, uh, in Europe. And I uh, just want to thank you for watching today's uh, European report. As we've discussed today in the light of recent terrorist attacks against the uh, Jewish communities, both in Paris and also now in Denmark, that we don't know what city's next, but one thing we do know is that we have to be resolute in the face of evil and that we need to stand up against the evil that is anti-Semitism and confront it where we see it. Apathy and indifference is no longer an option in these times. So thank you for watching today's uh, European Report.